It's Monday. This is How to Kill a Piano. I'm your host, the narrator, writer, musician, and human being, George Tate. I'm also a magician. I'm also a mentalist, but that's a bit redundant, I would say. We're all human beings here, probably. If you're here, it's because you've consciously made the decision to be here. If you're not a human being that has made the conscious decision and you're, say, an alien or a companion animal or a koala, wow, you're amazing. You should be famous because you're so doing something really cool right now and you're listening to me. I'm assuming that you have access to a human and that's how you've come by using whatever device you're listening to this on. Or, or maybe it's the end of the world and for some reason all humans everywhere are gone. And you're listening because you switched on one of the many abandoned devices. In any case, I wanted to take this moment before we get to the fifth chapter to say thank you for being here for tuning in and spending a little of your time with me. This is one of my favorite episodes or chapters of How to Kill a Piano because in this you'll get a glimpse of what the the piano is exactly and what it's doing in the basement. And you'll get a glimpse of what the piano might be capable of. At its heart, How to Kill a Piano is really just a story about compassion and love. Right now, it's really important to share compassion and love with other humans, not just immediately around you, but love and compassion for all humans that aren't even aware that we exist. A small gesture of kindness or love can have such a strong effect on our other fellow beings. It can really lift and heal parts of folks that they might not even know needed healing. And the most wonderful thing about compassion It's something you won't ever, ever have to run out of because you can always make more. There's always more to be made. And isn't that wonderful? One of my favorite musical artists, or the artist formerly known as, said, compassion is an action word with no boundaries, or something like that. My other favorite C word right now is the word compromise, because without it, without compromise, we don't have much traction to get anything done. For some people, compromise is a dirty, evil word, and they stay away from it. Those people might feel shame when when they compromise because some fictional text made them feel guilty. But the truth is, nothing in this world is truly black and white, or all right and wrong, or purely good, or purely evil. Compromise is the thing that sits at the center of all of it. It's what builds bridges, solidifies friendships, and brings longevity to our relationships. If there's one thing I've learned about life, it's this. Slow down. Appreciate what's around you. Try to see things from other people's perspective. And don't Forget to live. Love. I'm not going to say laugh because that's just a bad cliche of a sentence. But just live. Live every day like today is the last day you have. Because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Without further ado... Let's get to chapter five of How to Kill a Piano. The Nightmare. I've experienced this dream before. Well, it's more of a nightmare. It was more vivid this time than the last. I'm struggling on my back on the floor. It's cold. It's dark. This is the kind of dark where you can barely see your hand in front of your own face even after being in the room for more than five minutes. A piano bench is pinning me from above to the ground. I try with all my strength to push it and force it off of me, but it won't budge. I'm trapped. A red light 
Netflix on, I manage to tilt my head enough to look to my left. There, I see the piano. The keys are curling up like a cat, scraping and sharpening its claws across the carpet. I close my eyes tightly and open them again, hoping the images all vanish away. Instead, the bench begins to drag me towards the piano keys. The musical beastie is now grinning back at me with sharp teeth and an awaiting hungry mouth. The hood flings open and slams shut with loud rhythmic thuds. This repeats over and over and over again. I kick my legs and try to scream, but all that comes from my mouth is the sound of fingernails scraping across piano strings. This is the moment of the dream where I'm usually forced to wake to a silent house and find myself safely in bed with Uncle Charlie sleeping in the next room. It's always a relief because when I wake up, it's right before the demonic piano takes its first bite from my toes. This never gets easier. This time when I'm thrown awake, The house wasn't silent. I opened my eyes to a waxing crescent moon hitting me in the face through the bedroom window. I started to pull the cream-colored covers over my head as I rolled over onto my side to try to fall back asleep. But the music, it called louder. My light blue-colored footed pajamas were my only protection as I crawled out of bed and peeked my head out my bedroom door. The faint sound of fingernails scraping across the open piano strings still lingered in my ears and my memory. This sound was followed by the distinct beginning of Debussy's Claire de Lune. It was being played flawlessly. This confused me because I knew that Uncle Charlie didn't play. I closed my eyes for a moment and imagined that the music had lifted me out of bed and floated me down the hall towards the basement steps. My toes danced right above the floorboards of the house as the music pulled me. In reality, I dragged myself down the hall. No matter how softly tiptoed I was in the rubber-gripped toes of my pajamas, the floorboards seemed to scream underfoot as I tried to muffle their tiny voices by stuffing my toes gingerly between the cracks. I made my way down the dark hall, through the kitchen, and to the top of the basement stairs. It seemed like it took hours for me to get there, but it was only a few moments. An eerie, crimson glow crawled up the green asbestos-tiled steps and met me at the tip of my nose when I made it to the mouth of the basement. The whole scene reminded me of something from one of Uncle Charlie's zombie flicks. You know, just before the unnamed character has his brains ripped to shreds and arms torn off like a careless bully ripping the wings off a butterfly? Most kids my age were afraid of the dark. I was no different, but part of me enjoyed the feeling of my heart about to jump from my chest. With each step I took deeper towards whatever was making the piano sing, I tried to imagine what sort of gruesome creature was waiting for me at the belly of the maze of boxes and books. I began to imagine its eight long tentacles that stretched out from its torso, its suction cups dancing over the keys and strings. It had the long snout of a pig and the eyes of a muskrat that turned towards me as I approached. I imagined smoke billowing out from inside the mouth of the piano like a waterfall of fog that lingered on the floor like a river. The beast hovered in midair as it played Claire de Lune. Next, I imagined that maybe it had the head of a condor, the legs of a man, and wings and claws of a dragon. Its dark, scaly wings spread wide, creating an impenetrable wall around the instrument. Or maybe, I thought, the beast was more in human form. It had the head of a bull and body of a man, donning horns that reached up towards the sky, the tips stretching into points so sharp they'd scrape across the surface of a diamond, a minotaur guarding the center of my uncle's labyrinth-like Athenium. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that I'm safe. The beast can't hurt me. After all, I'm the main character in this story. I will make it to the end. As I stuck close to the wall, with my fingers curled tightly around the banister, the smooth wood ran under the palm of my hand with each step I took closer down the steps. I imagined the stairwell walls as if they were a cave, and that I was an explorer about to traverse its many caverns. It's still dark, I can barely see, 
but as I grow closer to the bottom of the steps, there is a light that shines through the many books and boxes coming from the dead center of everything. The light shines through like rays of sunshine reflecting through the haze on a misty day. I knew that if I go in alone, I might not know how to find my way out again. Thinking quickly, I grabbed an orange coiled extension cord. I tied one end to the bottom of the banister, securing it. I flung the rest of the coiled cord over my shoulder and began my journey towards the center of the labyrinth. As I traversed the path, I let the cord trail behind me, allowing it to record my path with each footstep. I coiled it up when I backtracked at each dead end and let more out when I found a path that advanced my journey. As I finally found myself approaching the center, I moved quietly and slowly. I didn't want to startle the beast. Seeing the hand of the creature first, I was surprised to see what resembled a human hand with its fingers clawing at the high notes. As I rounded the corner fully, I swear I saw the scraggly tail of a dog running out. The figure at the keys was dimly lit, but hardly looked like the monster I had envisioned. From behind, it almost looked human. Its back was a bright pigment of green, hunched over the keys. It was mumbling something to itself and sobbing. I couldn't see the head, and I couldn't understand. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Beast? Ma'am? I managed to muster, not sure of what the proper etiquette was when approaching such a creature. It was hardly appropriate to ask the beastly stranger what its preferred pronouns were. Its hands, or maybe claws, abruptly stopped touching the keys of the piano when it realized I was there. The room didn't just fall silent at that point, but it seemed void of any possible sound at all. It turned towards me slowly. I saw more of its giant distorted shadow projected and twisted against the walls and bookshelves than I did of the actual details of the creature itself. I stood my ground at the ready, knowing I couldn't be hurt. The shape of the creature's head started to take form as I was about to finally see what the creature truly was. Suddenly, books began to topple from a far shelf and something else jetted through them. It was coming right towards me, quickly in the dark. I could smell its foul breath as it knocked me over, landing on top of me, my head hitting the tile floor. I caught a glimpse of what I swear were the teeth of a dog before it snorted and quickly disappeared again in the darkness. Or was it that I blacked out at that point? Are you okay, buddy? Are you still with me? I heard Charlie's voice as I opened my eyes, finding myself on my back on the basement floor. What, what happened? I managed to mumble as I opened my eyes to see a blurry green robe with Charlie's head floating just above it. I blinked a few times. Uncle Charlie, you know it makes me cringe when you call me Buddy. Buddy is how you call a dog that you don't know. Charlie smiled, as if to apologize before answering. I'm not sure. I was down here mucking about with the piano and heard you fall down behind me. You must have slipped or something. What are you doing out of bed? Did you hear my awful attempt to play a tune on that thing? I didn't mean to wake you. I was probably hitting the keys too hard. I'm sure it wasn't pretty. I was serious when I told you all I could manage on that thing was going to be a bad rendition of chopsticks. Charlie, you were playing beautifully. I thought I was dreaming at first. I was standing behind you listening to you play, and it didn't even look like you. I thought you were a zombie or something. You were really good. Really good. Charlie chuckled, partly relieved that I wasn't hurt, but mostly because he thought I was being ridiculous. I thought you may have hit your head a bit too hard. You have quite the imagination. Now, we should get some ice cream on that bump and get you back into bed. Charlie nervously scooped me up off the floor and into his arms. Charlie, I'm not making it up, I insisted. You were really playing perfectly. And then something jumped out and attacked me. I didn't slip. Don't, don't you remember? I pleaded. You know very well I can't play much more than a kazoo, and even that's pretty bad. I'd love to be able to play like you say. Perhaps someday we'll be playing beautifully together. Let's get you upstairs now. I'll tuck you in. He carried me back through the maze of books along the path of the extension cord. 
I scanned the shelves, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever pushed me to the ground. I hoped to catch a whisk of its tail, a leg poking out from behind a book, or even its snout backing around the next corner. Anything that indicated that I hadn't imagined it. But all I saw were the spines of books lining the shelves and nothing more. Charlie carried me up the steps. The walls weren't the smooth stone I remembered as I stepped down the first time. Maybe Charlie was right, and I did imagine the whole charade. Charlie took me through the kitchen, down the hall over the floorboards that seemed to stay silent under his step, and into my room where he gently laid me down, pulling the covers up to tuck me back in for the night. Good night, George. Try to get some rest. We'll talk about that crazy dream in the morning. I love you. You've made it to the end of Chapter 5, How to Kill Piano. Thank you again so much for listening. My name is George Tate. I wrote this thing. The music I also improvised live as we were recording, with the exception of two things. The intro music and the outro music were provided by Apple's GarageBand system. And, of course, the music of Debussy's Claire de Lune is not mine. I, I played it, but I didn't write it because... I wasn't born yet, and I'm not a genius, like Debussy. Also, Euphemia Allen's tune of Chopsticks was hidden inside that whole debauchery written in 1877 is a lovely, annoying piece of music that I am so thankful (laughs) that it exists. Excuse me while I wipe the sarcasm from the side of my mouth. As always, if you can share this on your favorite social media platforms, I'd really appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe, all of those things. We are available on pretty much all podcasting platforms, including YouTube and Spotify and all those things. If you want to read more about us, you can find us at howtokillapiano.com. You can find more about me at thinkgeorgetate.com, spelled T-A-I-T, of course. And that's it for this week. So for now, I'll say goodbye and see you next Monday.